All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is, uh, I'm Sam Shookett. I'm the executive officer of the State Coastal Conservancy. And before we begin the meeting, I'm going to make some logistical announcements to help make the meeting flow more smoothly. Uh, I just got a text message, Doug, that Gail Miller is running about 15 minutes late. So she'll be, she'll be joining us in a little bit. Uh, first of all, unless you are speaking, please mute your phones uh, and mute your computer so we don't hear any background noise. And this is an announcement that probably will be made more than once during the course of the meeting. So the Conservancy members, myself and some Conservancy staff are logged into Zoom as panelists, which means that unless they mute their own microphones, we can hear them. Most of the Conservancy staff who have joined as panelists should also have their video off during the meeting to reduce the distractions on the screen. Um, everybody else who attends this meeting is going to be an attendee or uh, an audience member and they are automatically muted and are not on video so they don't have to mute themselves. Uh, in order to make public comments at the appropriate times in the agenda, you'll need to raise your hand via Zoom. Um, so panelists and, ah, see we have somebody whose uh, microphone is not muted. <laughs> so please make sure that your sound is muted. Um, that's, that's twice now. Uh, if you're a panelist, you can click on the participant button on the bottom of your screen and then click on the raise hand button at the bottom of the participant list on the right side. If you're an attendee, and this is particularly true for people of members of the public who want to make public comments, there is a raise hand option that shows up when you hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen if you're on your computer. If you're on your phone, press star nine on your telephone. So if you're only dialed in with your phone, press star nine. If you're on your computer screen, take your mouse down to the bottom of the screen and click the raise hand button when you want to make a, a public comment uh, on an item. Uh, we will also repeat these instructions during the course of the meeting. Also, if you're using your phone for sound, but you're watching the meeting on your computer, Make sure your computer is muted, otherwise we will get annoying feedback. Um, for each agenda item during the meeting, we will ask for public comment. If you want to make a comment on any issue not on the agenda, there is a time for general public comment at the end of the meeting before the closed session. If you sent us a public comment in advance by email, or if you left us a public comment in advance, on voicemail, we will read your comments into the record at the appropriate time. You do not need to comment during the meeting if you already sent us a public comment. Uh, and I see that uh, Chris has put up the handy dandy how to make a public comment uh, picture. Uh, so if you're on Zoom, you hit the raise hand button. And if you're on the telephone, you press star nine. Uh, um, and uh, I hope everybody appreciates the the beautiful graphics that went into the, the making of that. Um, when we get to the project portion of the agenda, here's how it's going to work. Chair Bosco will call for the item. Our tech support staff will play a PowerPoint presentation pre-recorded by the project staff that everyone will be able to see and hear, particularly since we spent a good 15 or 20 minutes this morning uh, messing around to make sure that they work. If Conservancy board members have questions, the staff person will share their video and mute themselves and answer them. Chair Bosco will ask if the grantee is on Zoom and wants to say a few words. Grantees will need to either raise their hand or push star nine to indicate that they want to speak. The grantee will be unmuted and will be able to speak. Then we will take any public comment on the item using the same process then we will read into the record any public comment we receive prior to the meeting via email or, or voicemail. Um, and for uh, board members, 
there's a, uh, so when we posted the agenda, we also put out a, a voicemail number that people could call into and leave public comment on. Um, after that, the board will discuss the item uh, and then vote. Because this is a teleconference, all votes will be roll call votes. Uh, as, as most of you know, our regular board clerk, Annalika White is on leave. Hillary Waleka has volunteered to act as the board clerk on the meeting while Ann is on leave. Chris Crossley and Andrew Ayung are keeping the technology running smoothly. And I wanna thank uh, Lisa Ames and Ashmika Singh who filled in and did a lot of the work that Ann usually does before the meeting, posting the agenda and so on. So thank you to everybody for, uh, for pitching in. And with that, Hillary, would you call the roll please? Ms. Nodoff? Uh, present. Mr. Padilla? Present. Mr. Cash? Here. Ms. Gutierrez Groundage? Present. Ms. Miller? Mr. Aliota? Present. Chair Bosco? Chair Bosco? You're in to... Oh, here. <laughs> we have a quorum. Okay, so thank you, Hillary. Doug, uh, we're ready to go. So go ahead and take it over. Thank you very much, Sam and Hillary. And um, welcome everyone to the June 2020 meeting of the State Coastal Conservancy. As you can see, we're in a different format today, somewhat reminiscent of Hollywood Squares. Um, and I want to ask you in advance to uh, forgive me for all the mistakes I'm likely to make because I am not technologically savvy. Uh, but it's uh, good to welcome you all today and we have some great projects coming up. Um, I'd first like to welcome our newest board member, um, Joseph Alioto. Um, Joe is a practicing attorney and has been a former assistant U.S. attorney, both here in Northern California and in Arizona. Um, he was appointed just recently by uh, Governor Newsom, and he comes from a very prominent family uh, here in California. And uh, Joe, we're very happy to have you join us. I'm sorry that we can't all be there in person together, so hopefully we will be at some point in the future. Thank you, Doug, and I want to say thank you to you and to all the staff and to all of the members uh, for your very warm welcome, and it's a great honor and a, and a privilege really for me to, to sit on this conservancy and participate in the wonderful work that you do, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first order of business then will be to approve the minutes. Does anyone have any uh, additions or corrections to the minutes of our last meeting? If not, uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. Uh, Ms. Nadoff moves, Mr. Cash seconds that we approve the minutes of the last meeting. And then will you please call the roll, Hillary? Ms. Nadoff? Aye. Mr. Padilla? Stain. Mr. Cash? Aye. Ms. Gutierrez Grandinch? Aye. Ms. Miller? Mr. Aliota? Abstain. Chair Bosco? Right. The mo this motion passes, the minutes are approved. Okay, the next item is the consent um, calendar. Uh, these are uh, relatively small and innocuous um, items that um, we generally approve all in one fell swoop. Uh, does anyone want uh, anything taken off the consent calendar? I just thought it would be good clarification for the public to um, identify why the large, there's a large project on there, the Crystal Cove, um, and explain why that's on the consent calendar before we vote. All right. Uh, Sam, would you like to explain that? Yeah. yeah. So the consent calendar are either items that are under a quarter of a million dollars or there are continuation of items that you have approved before. The Coastal Conservancy previously approved the grant to uh, construct or actually to, to reconstruct uh, some of the cottages at Crystal Cove. Uh, state parks had um, 
a couple of million dollars uh, in the budget for this, the fiscal year that's ending uh, in a few weeks for the same purpose. And uh, rather than uh, making the grantee have two separate uh, processes to, to spend that money, we thought it actually makes more sense for state parks to uh, give us that money and through an interagency agreement, and then we can spend the whole amount of it, which will, it adds up to about $5 million. So that's why there's a relatively large um, uh, item there. Uh, and, and just so, uh, because we have uh, 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 an entirely new board member and a relatively new member, uh, uh, I have a number of authorities delegated to me by the board. Uh, one of them is that I can, and the staff can uh, uh, receive money from other sources for projects, uh, but we can't spend it on anything uh, without board approval. So that's why that particular item uh, is on the agenda. And that's why it's on the, on the consent calendar. And we had a thorough, uh discussion about it at our February meeting, as I recall. Yes, we, yeah, they, that's right. The, the, our, our piece of the money was approved at the February, right. at the February meeting. Thank you. All right, do I hear a motion that we approve the consent calendar? Mr. Cash? So moved. And Ms. Nadoff, you want to second that? Sure. All right, um, please call the roll, Hillary. Ms. Nadoff? Aye. Mr. Padilla? Aye. Mr. Cash? Aye. Ms. Gutierrez Groundinch? Aye. Ms. Miller? Mr. Aliota? Aye. Chair Bosco? Aye. This motion passes. The consent items are approved. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go on to the next item on our agenda, which is our executive officer's report. Sam? Uh, thank you, Chair Bosco. Good morning. Uh, in addition to uh, welcoming um, Mr. Aliota to the board, I wanted to welcome uh, Chair Padilla uh, back to the land of the living. Uh, I'm not uh, violating HIPAA uh, by uh, saying that uh, he uh, had a, a close encounter with COVID-19 uh, because he wrote several op-eds uh, about his experience, uh, which was pretty pretty brutal, but it's, uh, it's nice to see you back. And uh, you were the uh, topic, uh, you were very much in our thoughts at several of the director's meetings that Secretary Crowfoot uh, had uh, when, you were, uh, when you were in the hospital. So it's great to see you. Thank you, Sam. It means a lot. It's great to be back. And all of that karma and thoughts and prayers were, were definitely felt. I tell colleagues and friends everywhere that I may have been very isolated there, but I sure as hell wasn't alone. I'm very grateful for that. So thank you for your comments. Um, so my, uh, my report uh, today is uh, pretty brief. Uh, I wanted to just let you all know sort of where we stand in terms of uh, personnel related to uh, coronavirus. Um, so right now we have about four and a half, uh, between four and a half and five full-time equivalent people uh, on leave. None of them, uh, as far as I know, are actually sick. All of them are uh, people uh, sort of struggling to balance work and, uh, and childcare. Uh, and some of them, it's, it's four and a half because some of them are, have basically gone, um, gone part-time. Uh, in addition, uh, you probably know that uh, the governor has been uh, recruiting contact tracers from in state service to go through training and be uh, uh, subsequently assigned to county health departments. Uh, and we have three uh, staff people, two project managers and one uh, person in our contracting unit who signed up for that duty. They've all gone through their training. Uh, none of them have actually been assigned yet. So as of right now, they're still working for us. But uh, 
any moment now, I think they'll get sent out to uh, whatever county they're going to be sent out to. And of course, when I say sent out, that's metaphoric. They're going to be working at home like the rest of us. Uh, so uh, in the not too distant future, we'll be down about um, seven, seven or eight staff people out of about 66. Uh, so that's about 10% uh, of the staff. Uh, and um, needless to say, all of the uh, parents uh, on our staff are waiting with bated breath to find out what the school and, uh, and uh, child care and daycare situation is going to be uh, going into the fall. Um, some parents have managed to find summer camps to, you know, put their, put their kids into. Uh, and then that has enabled them to, you know, to be, a, to be able to come back to work. Um, are there any sort of operational questions from the board about how we're how we're dealing with uh, the new uh, the new environment? I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank the conservancy for stepping up and providing the folks that you did for uh, contact tracing. Um, we know it's quite a sacrifice for all of our departments, and uh, you know our agency really stepped up big time. You know, we're 5% of the state workforce and we've really provided close to 20% of all the contact tracers so far. So thank you. You're welcome. And contact tracing is sort of a big, big part of the state's ability to, to, uh, to or in counties and cities to be able to start reopening. And Sam, I would echo that. Thanks. I mean, that's, it's onerous, particularly on smaller staffed agencies and departments. Uh, it's a big ask, but it's so critical uh, to be able to appropriately deal with what we're facing. So particularly grateful. Um, the other uh, report that I have for you this morning is a ledge report. Uh, it's been a very uh, odd legislative session, to say the least. Uh, and uh, Debbie Ruddick, who just turned on her camera, is going to give you the ledge report. Good morning, everybody. Long time no see. Uh, this has been, I've been doing this 15 years, and it's the, uh, to say the least, the strangest legislative session I've observed so far. I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, I just wanted to draw to your attention um, an important uh, piece of the schedule for the legislature, and that is Tomorrow's the last day for fiscal committees to hear and report bills to the floor. And uh, also, I believe the assembly goes on recess after tomorrow, uh, and they'll be gone for a while. The Senate doesn't go on, resource, uh, on recess for a couple of weeks because they, they joined the legislative session a little bit late, but everybody will be back on July 13th, and uh, the, the recess will be abridged, and they'll go until August 31st. So uh, tomorrow is, is a big day for uh, several bills that we're tracking, um, including um, the Assembly Resources uh, Now Economic Recovery Bond, um, which is currently an Assembly rule. So if it's going to move, unless there's a waiver, of course, it'll have to um, move to fiscal tomorrow and, and pass out. The Senate's bond, uh, SB 45, is already in the Assembly. And uh, as you'll see that there are several bills uh, that have fallen by the wayside that are currently dead for this session. Um, there's a couple of bills that will be heard in appropriations today. That's SB 1296, which is the, uh, the bill that would provide uh, money for the state conservancies and the wildlife conservation board that um, engage in um, climate resilience projects, but that also provide job training whereby we would give money to nonprofits that would provide the, uh, the jobs training piece. And then the Hueso Bill SB 1301, which would require the San Diego River Conservancy to produce a Tijuana River Valley binational watershed management plan. And uh, with that, I'll just open it up to any questions you might have. I just uh, have one question about um, whether or not the conservancy has been able to engage at all with the governor's economic recovery task force, uh, part of their 
uh, consideration, I believe, is whether or not to do a bond and how to do a bond as part of the economic recovery. And many of the um, restoration projects in particular that the conservancy engages us are, you know, good um, job producers and could be a, play a meaningful role in the economic recovery task force. So um, I don't know, Brian or uh, Deborah, if you know if the resources agency is engaged in that, those deliberations to advise the governor. Yeah, uh, Wade has been in talks with the economic recovery task force and um, he's let them know how we feel. <laughs> 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 yeah, the deadline to get things on the ballot for November is uh, June 25th, so a week from Friday. Um, again, they could ostensibly, you know, waive the rules to get something on the ballot, but uh, currently that's the deadline. Um, Brian, would you uh, like to give just a quick update along the lines of what you gave at the director's meeting yesterday on the the state of play of the, the budget, which has also been unusual. Sure. Uh, the, were you talking to me or were you talking to Deborah? You were talking to- No, to, 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 to Brian, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because just you're there. <laughs> so the, this is, a, uh, as Deborah was saying, this is an odd year for a lot of things. Uh, the legislature, uh, the legislative session and the budget. Uh, a budget did pass on Monday. Um, what happens with that budget remains to be seen. There are some things that are still up in the air. Uh, the administration is going in and talking with the legislature on a, a final solution. Um, it's an odd year because tax revenues, the, the main tax revenues, personal income tax, were delayed until July. So we really won't know what the revenues look like until mid-July. So I would imagine this year there will probably be uh, some additional budget bill juniors that are passed during the summer that go along with the trailer bills. Um, so we probably won't have a final, final budget until um, somewhere in July or August after the rev <coughs> revenues come in mid-July. So. so yeah, it's gonna be uh, 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 an ever, uh, <laughs> a long budget season this year. So it's the never ending budget season. Exactly. Uh, are there any, uh, are there any questions about, uh, about any of this? Um, hearing none, um, Doug, I just wanted to remind you that when we get into the project portion of the agenda to um, give a nice long pause when you ask for uh, public comment. Uh, and thank you, Debbie, uh, for the report. Uh, we have a fairly long agenda today, so I went for a shorter executive officer's report, but I have several things I'm going to be putting on the EO report uh, at, the, uh, at the September meetings, so it will not be uh, quite as brief as this. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Um, as I think you all know, we will have presentations that have been pre-recorded and these staff presenters will be available after the presentation to answer any questions from the board. And then we'll go on to um, uh, ask anyone from the public that wants to comment to do so. And then we will read any um, formal uh, communications that have been submitted to us and then we'll vote on on the items. So I think what we'll do now is go on to the uh, San Francisco Bay Area and um, item five and Brenda Buxton will present that item. Good morning, Conservancy Board members and Chair Bosco. My name is Brenda Buxton, and today I'm recommending authorization of the Sobrato South Acquisition Project 
a project that has been many decades in the making. Many of you may be familiar with the Coyote Valley from driving US 101 to or from San Jose. In this photo, in the center right, you can see the interstate hugging the hills of the Diablo Range. To the west are agricultural lands and the Santa Cruz Mountains. Coyote Creek is the major river in this area and it flows north towards the top of the photo all the way to San Francisco Bay. This larger scale graphic illustrates how the Coyote Valley is one of the few open space areas left between these two mountain ranges. As many of you know, many public agencies, including the Conservancy, have invested in land conservation in these two mountain ranges. Coyote Valley is the bridge that connects these two mountain ranges and their wildlife populations. Protecting the Coyote Valley protects the public's investment in the broader region. As you drive through the Coyote Valley, it seems like the country, but in fact, much of the valley is within the city limits of San Jose. Being just a short car trip south of Silicon Valley, well, at least it used to be, Coyote Valley has attracted many development proposals over the last few decades. IBM was one of the first to build a campus in northern Coyote Valley. Many in the conservation community will tell you that when you start to see newspaper headlines like this, when a property has captured the imagination of a pro company like Apple, it's too late. Property's too expensive and the land use planning has made it a done deal. And in the fall of 2000, that indeed seemed the case. The Coyote Valley specific plan was announced with great fanfare in the newspapers and media. This ambitious development scheme was going to virtually create a new town with 25,000 homes and twice as many jobs. And so it seemed inevitable that the floodplains and the farms would disappear under more suburban sprawl. Fortunately, I am here today requesting authorization of $5 million of Proposition 1 funds to acquire the Sobrato South property because the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, the proposed grantee, is one of the organizations who refuse to give up on saving the Coyote Valley. The Open Space Authority has been working very hard to acquire over 900 acres, shown in orange on this graphic, to permanently preserve the open space, agriculture, and natural resources, as well as the wildlife corridors of Northern Coyote Valley. Fortunately, the Open Space Authority has not had to do this alone. The city of San Jose funded a portion of the Brandenburg property acquisition, and the Peninsula Open Space Trust, better known as POST, acquired the remainder of the Brandenburg property, as well as the Sobrato North property. Those two properties are outlined in purple and yellow on this graphic. The last piece of the puzzle to permanently protect the Northern Coyote Valley is the Sobrato South property, which is shown here circled in blue. This aerial photo shows a closer view of the Sobrato South property. Currently used to farm hay and graze cattle, this approximately 235 acre property has significant habitat value with approximately 22 acres of wetland habitats and it provides suitable habitat for California red-legged frog, California tiger salamander, tricolored blackbird, and burrowing owl. Bobcats have also been detected moving through the Fisher Creek corridor on this property. Sobrato South is also immediately adjacent to a proposed alignment of the Bay Area Ridge Trail. The property, along with the adjacent acquisitions, provides natural floodplains. These acquisitions will help protect the watershed's ability to reduce and delay peak flows, providing a downstream flood protection benefit to the city of San Jose. This benefit, as well as the others I've mentioned, make this project consistent with the purposes of Proposition 1. This $16 million acquisition will be funded with $10 million from the Wildlife Conservation Board that was approved in May, an additional $1 million from Peninsula Open Space Trust or POST, as well as the $5 million proposed today from the Coastal Conservancy. And in conclusion, I would like to remark that many Californians have had the experience of visiting or living in a place named after the natural features that used to be there. Oakland, for example. But this time the story has a different ending. 
And with this acquisition, we can ensure that there will always be coyotes in Coyote Valley. I am now turning over the presentation to Matt Freeman, who is the Deputy Executive Officer of the Open Space Authority. And Matt and I will be available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah. Uh, Matt, did you want to speak now? Okay. Yeah, he needs to be unmuted. Uh, Matt, if you want to speak, please unmute yourself. Okay, why don't we do this? Let's ask if any of the board members have comments, and Matt can comment afterwards if he wants. Brian? Excuse me, Mr. Chair, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, I can. Let's go ahead. Matt Friedman. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda. And good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the board. On behalf of the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, I really want to thank you for your consideration of this critical funding. Along with many other partners, we are achieving an extraordinary new conservation future for the Coyote Valley. As articulated in AB 948, which established the Coyote Valley Conservation Program, Coyote Valley is a resource of statewide significance. And its many conservation values are reflected in the Sobrato South property, as Brenna des described. It closes a critical gap in the landscape linkage connecting over 1 million acres in the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, and the Diablo Range. And this connection is really essential to ensure the long-term health of Puma populations in the Santa Cruz Mountains. The property's riparian vegetation, ponds, and wetlands provide habitat for many rare species. And these floodplain features serve as a vital natural infrastructure, capturing stormwater and reducing downstream flooding impacts to urban San Jose. And finally, the property closes a really critical gap in the network of parks, open spaces, and regional trails, including the Bay Area Ridge Trail. So funding from the Conservancy will allow the authority to add this property to our 30,000 acre system of protected lands. And our aim is to plan and manage the property to implement a landscape scale conservation vision and to establish a truly unique open space preserve located within the city of San Jose, the nation's 10th largest city, benefiting millions of people in the Bay Area. So I'd like to express our appreciation for your really excellent staff who moved this project forward. Brenda Buxton, um, Moira McInnespy and Kim Kernan, among others, and also to our partners in conservation at the Peninsula Open Space Trust or POST. They worked tirelessly to get this property under contract as part of the much larger $93.5 million transaction. And I'll leave it there. Um, thank you so much and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Freeman. Are there any questions to ask uh, Mr. Freeman first? Brian? Sure. Uh, this looks like a great acquisition. Um, very excited to, uh, to see this and to be able to approve it. Uh, just had a question on uh, wildlife connectivity. I know down south there, um, we've been working on a huge project to connect two sides of the 101 down in uh, Calabasas. And I was wondering if there's something in the works here or if there's something existing which gets animals either underneath or, or over the, the 101. Sure, happy to take that. Um, there are a number of culverts and undercrossings under Highway 101 and Coyote Valley. The real barrier is Monterey Highway. And so we're working with a number of conservation partners, including High Speed Rail, to look at opportunities to create new underpassings or overcrossings above Monterey Highway to make that long-term connection, um, potentially for mountain lions, but for bobcats, um, coyote, many other species. And so we're gonna be really getting into those details as part of a comprehensive master planning process that'll be um, getting underway later this summer and early fall. Great, glad to hear it. Okay, are there any other questions for Mr. Freeman or comments in general from the board? If not, um, are there any public comments? All right, uh, do we have any written comments? 
There were none submitted. Okay. Thank you. Well, then I'll entertain a motion to approve this project. Who'd like to move it? So moved. Mr. Okay. Cash moves, and Ms. Nodok, do you want to second this? Looks like Gail is seconding there. Oh, She's Gail joined us. I don't have Gail on my um, Hollywood Squares. <laughs> do you, if you I'll go to gallery view, view, Doug. Everyone. Gallery view? Yeah. I don't have a gallery view. I don't yes, you do. Go to. Are oh. you on speaker view right now? Like, click on the very top. Up, upper right hand corner of your screen, it'll say speaker oh, view. Oh, okay. well, in part, it's my fault for wow. being my apologies. <laughs> okay, hi, Gail. Hi. Right. Um, Mr. Cash moves, Ms. Miller seconds that we approve this item, um, item five. Um, please call the roll. Ms. Nada? Aye. Mr. Padilla? Aye. Mr. Cash? Aye. Ms. Gutierrez Groundage? Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Mr. Aliota? Aye. Chair Bosco? Aye. This motion passes. Agenda item five is approved. Thank you very much. And thank you, Brenda. Great job for everyone that worked on this and Mr. Freeman as well. Thank you, Doug. Okay, we're gonna go on now to item six. I can find it on my schedule. That is uh, Cochrane Creek and um, Sue Corberly Cur will present that item. Sue? There you are. Thank you, Chairman Bosco and members of the State Coastal Conservancy. This is Sue Corbley, and I will be presenting the Cochrane Creek Fish Passage and Channel Restoration Construction Project for your consideration. Staff recommends the Conservancy authorize the disbursement of $640,000 to California Trout to implement construction activities to enhance fish passage to Cochrane Creek and restore fish rearing habitat on Cochrane Creek and Quail Slough. The proposed disbursement will come from Conservancy Proposition 1 funds that are matched by grants awarded to Caltrout, including $500,000 of Caltrans Environmental Enhancement and Mitigation Program funds and $996,900. As shown in this regional map, the project site is located in Humboldt County in Northern California. It is located on the eastern edge of Humboldt Bay on the Organic Matters Ranch, a privately owned farm that grows vegetables, field crops, and raises small livestock and chickens for sale. This slide shows the historical distribution of tidal salt marsh around Humboldt Bay, which encompasses the project area. The lower reach of Cochrane Creek, where it discharges to Fay Slough, was a transitional area from upstream freshwater aquatic habitats to brackish water and estuarine habitat that supported abundant aquatic species, including, among many others, coho salmon, chinook, steelhead trout, tidewater goby, and Pacific lamprey. In the early 1900s, levees were built and the marshes were drained to create pasture lands for ranching and farming, thus effectively eliminating the stream bay interface. In this slide, you see an aerial photo of the Organic Matters Ranch property. The project disturbance area, depicted by the dashed red line, is approximately 20 acres and consists of a subsided agricultural field that floods frequently and does not fully support field crops or grazing. The orange line in the upper right corner is the current alignment of Cochrane Creek. You can see that it has been channelized, straightened, and pushed up against the levees at the eastern and northern property boundaries. The green line is Quail Slough, which traverses north across the pasture where it joins Cochrane Creek at the tide gate where the system drains to Fay Slough. Lower Cochrane Creek currently has little effective tidal connection with Humboldt Bay, with none of the historic salt marsh present. There is no longer the twice daily tidal inundation that would bring in important nutrients and remove sediment from the system. 
Fish passage is severely impeded by a poorly functioning tide gate at the Cochrane Creek Face Slough Junction, and the channels lack complexity, shade canopy, and habitat diversity. The photos in this slide show the channels as primarily slow moving and choked with vegetation, with invasive reed canary grass dominating. Cochrane Creek is undersized and confined, which forces most flood flows to go out of bank and flood the field. Quail slough is clogged with vegetation and sediment, causing low oxygen levels and high temperatures. The culvert under Myrtle Avenue is sediment filled and floods frequently. This slide is of a site map showing the project elements that will be constructed to restore fish passage, enhance and expand tidal, brackish, and freshwater habitat, and increase flood protection of agricultural lands. A poorly functioning tide gate will be replaced, 1,000 feet of Cochrane Creek will be realigned and enhanced, and 2,100 feet of quail slough will be widened. Five acres of wetlands, both tidal and freshwater, will be restored, 1.5 acres of wetland plants, and 2.7 acres of trees will be planted. Finally, the surface elevation of the ag field will be raised to improve drainage. This slide shows a cute juvenile coho salmon that was captured during fish monitoring on Cochrane Creek in 2016. This capture and other recent observations of additional anadromous fish important to Humboldt Bay economy, including Chinook, steelhead trout, and Pacific lamprey, bodes well for a successful outcome of the project and all expectations are that these native fish will move into the restored area soon after project completion. The proposed project is an excellent opportunity to accomplish meaningful restoration of fish anadromy on Humboldt Bay. It is supported by Congressman Jared Huffman, State Senator Mike McGuire, State Assembly Member Jim Wood, and the Humboldt County Board of Supervisors and Public Works Departments. This concludes my presentation. I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Sue. Are there any questions uh, or comments from the board? All right, if not, um, are there any comments from the public? And just as a reminder from the public, uh, you either need to press star nine on your phone if you're dialed in or uh, uh, find the raise hand uh, button on your uh, screen and we'll, we'll be able to unmute you. Okay, hearing none, are there any written communications? No, none were submitted. Okay, did uh, Cal Trout want to say something? I have that on my... Chair Bosco? Yes. This is Sue. Um, Darren Moreau is uh, available online should there have been any questions. Uh, we didn't prepare any that he would speak to the board. Okay. Well, certainly we thank Cal Trout for sure. It's a good project. All right, do I hear a motion that we approve uh, this item? Uh, I'll move. Who did that? Yep. Okay. Ms. Miller moved, Ms. Nadoff second, uh, that we approve this item which is item six. Um, please uh, call the roll. Ms. Nada? Aye. Mr. Padilla? Aye. Mr. Cash? Aye. Ms. gutierrez Groundinch. Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Mr. Aliota? Aye. Chair Bosco? Aye. This motion passes. Agenda item six is approved. Okay. Thank you, Sue Corberly and all of our staff who worked on this. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, we'll go on now to item seven, and Lisa Ames will present that, Dutch Bill Creek in Sonoma County. Good morning, Chairman Bosco and Conservancy Board members. This is Lisa Ames, and I will be presenting the Dutch Bill Creek Parkway Acquisition Project for your consideration. Staff recommends the Conservancy authorize disbursement of $500,000 to Sonoma County Regional Parks to acquire a 515-acre property that includes a stretch of Dutch Bill Creek, a tributary to the Russian River. 
The purpose of this acquisition is to protect open space, habitat, natural floodplain, and water quality, and to provide an opportunity to develop a future regional parkway with recreational trails. As shown on this regional map, the property is located in Western Sonoma County in the Lower Russian River watershed. The property lies at the north end of the scenic 10-mile Bohemian Highway, just south of the small hamlet of Monte Rio, an economically disadvantaged community. On this slide are images of Dutch Bell Creek flowing through the property. The creek is an important fish corridor for endangered Central California coast coho salmon and threatened steelhead trout, and it was identified as a Lower Russian River core priority recovery area for coho by the National Marine Fisheries Service in 2012. The Dutch Bell Creek watershed is home to a diverse wildlife community, including giant California salamander and western pond turtles, acorn woodpeckers and spotted owls, mountain lions and bobcats, and numerous other sensitive plant and animal species that will benefit from keeping the property undeveloped as proposed by this project. This site map shows the property's relationship to the town of Monte Rio and nearby open space and protected areas. Acquisition of the parcel will provide an open space connection between two critical wildlife habitat corridors running north-south through Sonoma County and east-west from inland to the coast. Additionally, the proposed project will improve public access to the protected lands shown here and potentially expand inland trails that will ultimately connect to the coast. Acquiring this property will give regional parks the opportunity to develop the Dutch Bell Creek Regional Parkway. This public trail segment is the first step in realizing the decades long planning by Sonoma County for an eventual 5.5 mile trail connecting Occidental to Monte Rio along or parallel to the historic North Pacific Coast Railroad right of way. Almost 90% of the property is forested, mostly redwood, and the remaining upland habitats include oak woodland and serpentine influenced chaparral. Nearly half of the property is harvestable timberland. If acquired by regional parks, the property's timber will not be commercially harvested. Based on a forest management plan to be completed after acquisition, regional parks may conduct forest thinning for fuel management and forest health purposes. As you can see from these historical photos, tourists have been flocking to the fresh air of Monte Rio and its environs for generations. First by train in the 1870s, and then by car starting in the 1930s. Recreating on the Russian River continues to be a Should I jump in here? <laughs> Popular and healthy, low cost That's escape good. for urban life and economically beneficial to the small communities here. Today, the Bohemian Highway is also a popular bicycle route. This multi benefit project will protect wildlife and plant habitats and create a safe and scenic route within the Redwood Forest for the public to access communities and landscapes of Western Sonoma County. The project has overwhelming support from the community, the region, and beyond, as shown by the support letters included with the staff recommendation. That concludes my presentation. Regional Parks is on the line to help with any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, are there any questions or comments from the board? Uh, Lisa, I just have to ask you this. How big is the giant salamander? It sounds kind of ominous. Sorry, I can it. Well, I actually, it's a California giant salamander. I said the giant California salamander. So it's, it's, it's about, I'm not sure, to be honest. Is it like in the horror films or is No, it... no, no, no. It, it's <laughs> okay. probably a small cat. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> We'll stay away from there. Um, uh, you know, um, former Governor Jerry Brown and his wife Anne are residents, part-time residents now of, of uh, Monterio. So I imagine this project will be pleasing to them as well. All right, are there any comments from the public? It's about six to 12 inches long. 
<laughs> oh, six to 12. A very oh. small cat. That's no, a pretty God, big cat. <laughs> Well, six to 12 inches, you could probably cope with that, you know, if you ran into one, but I wouldn't want it much bigger. Um, all right, uh, are there members of the public who would like to comment on this? All right, hearing none, um, do, Hillary, do we have any written comments? No, none were submitted. All right, so who would like to move that we approve this item, item seven? Mar Mars, oh, Marcy, you want to? Okay. And then um, Brian, you want to second it? I sure will. All right. Please call the roll. Ms. Nodoff? Aye. Mr. Padilla? Aye. Mr. Cash? Aye. Ms. Gutierrez Grundinch? Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Mr. Aliotto? Aye. Chair Bosco? Aye. This motion passes, agenda item seven is approved. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. All right, we'll now go to the Central Coast where we have the Capitola Wharf in Santa Cruz County and Tim Duff will present that item. Thank you, Chairman Bosco and members of the State Coastal Conservancy Board. This is Tim Duff, and I'll be presenting the Capitola Wharf Renovation Project. Slide two is an aerial map that shows the location of the wharf near the mouth of Soquel Creek in Santa Cruz County. Staff recommends that the Conservancy authorize disbursement to the city of Capitola of up to $1.9 million appropriated to the Conservancy from the state's general fund, specifically for the renovation of the Capitola Wharf. The renovation will include improvements to the pier's structural resiliency by widening and raising the height of the pier and relocating utility lines above deck. Renovating aging access facilities like the Capitola Wharf will serve to increase and enhance coastal access as called for in the Conservancy by three is a photo of the wharf taken from nearby bluff looking south. As with most piers in small beach towns along the California coast, the 855 foot wharf serves as a hub of commercial and recreational activity and is an iconic and defining feature of the city's waterfront. As shown on this slide, the wharf widens at the ocean end to accommodate a restaurant, fishing facilities, and a boat rental operation. This slide shows groups of sunbathers on the beach next to the pier in small sailing boats. Yes, it's from another era, but who wouldn't want to be back there now? The wharf attracts an estimated 75,000 people annually, including many seeking to enjoy access to the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary by visiting the beach, surfing, kayaking, fishing, or simply walking on the pier. Unfortunately, the surrounding beach and wharf lack adequate restroom facilities. The only restroom is located near the ocean end of the pier at the back of the restaurant where it is difficult to find. Though in summer months, the city puts porta potties at the pier, uh, foot of the pier um, near the, at the beach near the foot of the wharf. The pier renovation includes the construction of restroom facilities at both ends of the pier to serve visitors to the pier and beach. Slide five shows the structural elements of the pier that are to be repaired or replaced. While the wharf has undergone emergency repairs for periodic storm damage over the past several decades, a comprehensive structural renovation has never been completed. The proposed project would increase wharf resiliency and improve public safety by widening the narrow section of the wharf. Widening the pier will also improve public access 
by reducing pedestrian and vehicular conflicts. As shown on this slide, the pier's piles, pile caps, stringers, and decking will be replaced or retrofitted where needed. Water, sewer, and electric utility lines will be relocated above the pier deck to protect them from wave damage. In addition to the new restrooms, lighting will be improved and the number and size of benches will be increased. That concludes my presentation. City staff are also on the call and we are available to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Tim. Um, are there any questions from the board? Okay, do we have any public comments? Any written communications? Looks like someone does have their hand raised for... Um... Yeah, we do have a public comment. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead and unmute them. Okay, go ahead. I think they're still muted. Kalis, you're uh, we've unmuted right. you. You there you go. Go ahead and talk. My apologies. This is Steve Jesberg. I'm with Kalosh Mazumder. My I'm the public works director. Kalosh is my project manager on this. Uh, we're with the city of Capitol and we just want to uh, thank you for taking this item on this morning. We appreciate the support of uh, Assemblyman Member Stone and Tim Duff in helping us get to this point and we're available for any questions should you have any. Hey, thank you. Are there any questions? Didn't we have a field trip on that wharf a long time ago? Seems familiar. Yeah, I think we did. Um, well, okay, uh, who'd like to move approval of this item? Looks like a good project. I'm happy to move approval. All right, Ms. Nodoff moves and um, Mr. Cash seconds, or Mr. Padilla seconds, good, all right. Uh, please call the roll. Ms. Nodoff? Aye. Mr. Padilla? Aye. Mr. Cash? Aye. Ms. gutierrez Grundinch. Aye. Ms. Miller? Did we lose Ms. Miller? Aye. Uh, Mr. Alioto? Aye. Chair Bosco? Aye. This motion passes. Agenda item eight is approved. All right, great. Thank you, Tim. Uh, let's go on to item nine, which is um, Monterey Peninsula Regional Park District. One million dollars and Tom Gansberry will make that presentation. Tom? Good morning, Chairman Bosco and members of the board. My name is Tom Gansberry and I will be presenting the floodplain restoration project at the... Staff recommend that the Conservancy accept grant funds of up to $1 million to plan, design, and prepare permit and grant applications and environmental impact analysis, that is a CEQA and NEPA analysis, for the restoration of floodplain on the Carmel River on a property that is the former Rancho Kenyatta Golf Course. Here is a map showing the location of the site. It is in the lower part of the Carmel River watershed, about a mile the property was acquired by the Monterey Peninsula Regional Park District from the Trust for Public Land in 2016. The property is uh, currently managed partially uh, open to the public as a park, but the goal of this project is to restore floodplain on the site. River floodplain is a critical element of river systems to the survival of steelhead salmon and other aquatic species. At one time, there were thousands of acres of floodplain in the lower reaches of the Carmel River, nearly all of which has been lost to development of one sort or another. 
Floodplain is also an important nursery ground for young fish in which they grow to sufficient size before going downstream to the ocean. And it can provide a physical refuge during high flow events. As a side note, the Coastal Conservancy also supported floodplain restoration at a project immediately downstream from this property called CR Carmel River Free, which stands for Floodplain Restoration and Environmental Enhancement. The Carmel River Free project is on, is on land owned by the Big Sur Land Trust. And it was briefly discussed in my presentation at the last board meeting in which we recommended a grant to the Carmel Area Wastewater District to facilitate CR Free. The CR Free project is in the permitting phase right now and could be funded largely through a FEMA grant. This photo shows how the site is near commercial and residential areas and the CR Free project is indicated by the yellow box and arrow. As I mentioned, this project will be funded by a grant to the Conservancy from the Park District. The Conservancy was asked by the Park District to act as a technical manager and to manage the project because of our past involvement with other restoration projects in the Carmel River watershed. Also, the Park District is a small special district agency with limited staff to manage new and complex undertakings. And is in the midst of planning for the entire Palo Corona Regional Park of which this is but a small part. This map shows how the property is part of that larger Palo Corona Regional Park. The Conservancy has agreed to accept an initial grant of $617,610 from the Park District and subsequently later in the summer or fall another grant of $382,000 making a total of a million dollars. This funding will come via a Trust for Public Land, which received the funding as part of an agreement to reduce river water withdrawals from the now retired golf course. These payments were a condition of sale, so it's anticipated that future funding to undertake construction of the project would come from other sources, such as federal and state grants. This image is an idealized cross section of a natural floodplain of the sort that we hope to restore at the site. Currently, the river is confined to a straightened channel. This project would take place on land that is the former Rancho Cañada Golf Course. In 2016, the Coastal Conservancy, along with the Wildlife Conservation Board and others, assisted with the purchase of this property with a grant of $2 million. The total acquisition was $10,265,000. Shortly after the transfer of the land to the Park District, the Conservancy supported the formation of a Technical Advisory Committee to study and advise on the restoration of this property. The te Technical Advisory Committee is made up of experts in repairing restoration from federal and state agencies, as well as the, as well, excuse me, as the Monterey Peninsula Water Management Agency and Trout Unlimited. It is our intention to involve the TAC at key milestones in this project. This figure shows the area that would be set aside for restoration relative to the rest of the property, which has other park uses. Here are some photos of the site. This is an enhanced version of an air photo taken in 1939. Note that the floodplain is in green. This is the same area in 1974. If you toggle back and forth, you can see how much floodplain was lost. Note that this is not the quote unquote 100 year floodplain, but rather an area that would see flooding on a two year, a five year, and a 10 year event. Here is that earlier 1930s version. And this is the 1974 version again. Now I want to show you a couple photos of the site and the river itself. This is looking upstream. Most of the former golf course is off to the left behind those trees. And the river is at a relatively low flow of about 110 cubic feet per second. 
Here we are in that same area in 2017, and the river is running at about 3,300 cubic feet per second. This is what would be called bank fall. In this case, the floodplain would be wet and would be providing uh, most of its benefits. Over the years, the river bank has been armored. We have a good record of where some of the more recent work was done, and so we know what to remove. Some of those areas are shown in red on this image. Here's a photo looking downstream after the very large 1995 winter floods, which washed out bridges and resulted in extensive flooding of the surrounding area. The flooding river water was estimated at 16,000 cubic feet per second that year. And if I could show you only one image to illustrate the benefit of floodplains, it would be this one. These young salmon were taken in fish traps on the Yolo Bypass, which is that area located between Davis and Sacramento, and is managed as both a flood control facility and for wildlife habitat. This photo shows how the young fish compare to those which were growing in the main part of the Sacramento River system. Sampling by UC Davis and others has shown that floodplains provide food and shelter for young of the year fish. Though not intended as a flood control project, the proposed project would reduce the threat of flooding to some degree, as well as enhance wildlife viewing and recreation at the park. This concludes my presentation and hopefully I'll be on the say I'll be on the line. That's it. Thank you. So I'm on the line. If you have any questions about that, I got cut off at the last second there. Hey, Doug, you're on mute. You're still on you. mute. Oh, so. Mr. Chair? You are muted. Lower uh, left-hand corner of your screen, Doug, to unmute. Uh-oh. Well, here's a new technical difficulty. Chris, can you unmute, Doug? Well, there we go. There we go. I'm, I'm unmuted now. Yes, yeah. you are. Yeah, but I still have no visual image other than a big sign that says Zoom. Doug, did you accidentally turn your camera off? Uh, I don't think so. Closer to the, no? I don't think so. Do you want me to just try to get back on again? You're on. Uh, we can see you. We, we can. We can. We can all see you. Oh, really? Well, I can't yeah. see anybody. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there is probably a small icon um, with, uh, you know, like a zoom icon. So it's just minimized. Um, Yeah, the, the zoom icon is a, uh, a a little blue dot with what looks like a little. Yeah, I know, camera. but I don't have that available. Let's see. okay, zoom icon. All right. I can't join my meeting. Should I press that one? Uh, no, because you're in the meeting. We can all see you and hear you. Well, if you can see me, I can hear you. So why don't we just go on with the meeting? <laughs> I can't see any of you, but I can hear you. Um, all right, thank you, Tom. Uh, are there any board comments? I just wanted to add, if I could, um, we got some late letters of support, one of which I think made it to you uh, via email. That was um, from... Um, the Santa Lucia Conservancy, I may have these switched, but the Santa Lucia Conservancy, Dr. Christy Wyckoff sent a letter 
of support, as did um, the president of the Carmel River Conservancy, Abby Bean. Um, so both of those organizations sent in letters just in the last couple of days. All right. I would just make the comment, um, this is a really important project for this part of the river um, and really complements uh, a lot of other investments that have been made and that will be made in the future and uh, uh, would be glad to move approval. Okay, Mr. Cash moves. Um, Ms. Nada, do you want to second this? No. I think uh, Ms. Grodden wanted to. All right, Mars, do you want to? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded then that we approve item nine. Uh, those in, well, please call the roll. Ms. Nadoff? Aye. Mr. Padilla? Aye. Mr. Cash? Aye. Ms. Gutierrez Groundinch? Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Mr. Alioto? Aye. Chair Bosco? Aye. This motion passes, agenda item nine is approved. Okay, thank you, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, by the way, you all have miraculously reappeared on my <laughs> screen, so. <laughs> I, I didn't do anything, but uh, it happened, so we're back in order. Okay, we'll go on now to item 10, the Santa Ana River Trail, and Greg Gauthier will present this item, Greg. Thank you, Chairman Bosco and members of the State Coastal Conservancy Board. This is Joel Gerwine and I will be presenting uh -oh. the Santa Ana River Trail Hamner Avenue Bridge Construction Project on behalf of Greg Gothier, the project manager. Staff recommends that the Conservancy Board authorize disbursement of $2,965,000 to the Riverside County Regional Park and Open Space District for construction of a segment of trail and two access ramps as part of the Hamner Avenue Bridge Construction as shown on the map, the project is in the county of Riverside in the city of Norco. The Hamner Avenue Bridge crosses the Santa Ana River into the city of Eastvale. This is a cooperative project between the County Riverside Transportation and Land Management Agency, the cities of Norco and Eastvale, Caltrans, and the Riverside County Regional Park and Open Space District. The total budget for the project is $65 million. Conservancy funds would be used solely for the purpose of constructing the Santa Ana River Trail access ramps and multi-purpose trail segment across the bridge. This is an aerial photo of the existing bridge showing the city of Norco on the left and lower part of the photo and the city of Eastvale on the upper right hand side of the photo. The red arrow in the lower area shows where the Santa Ana River Trail ends in Norco and the arrow in the upper portion shows the trail terminus in Eastvale. The proposed project will connect these two trail segments, creating a continuous 26 mile stretch of the Santa Ana River Trail. That is slightly more than one quarter of the planned trail length. This schematic aerial view of the new bridge shows the location of the two access ramps that will allow safe passage over the bridge via the new multi-purpose trail segment. This critical linkage on the Santa Ana River Trail will provide a connection between the Hidden Valley Wildlife Area and the city of Norco on the south side of the river to the Silver Lakes Equestrian and Sports Park, Eastvale Community Park, Riverwalk Park, and city of Eastvale on the north side of the river. The red arrows on this slide show where the trail will connect to the Eastvale portion of the trail through a causeway under the bridge. The green line shows where a new sidewalk will be built to allow access to Citrus Street. This conceptual image of the Santa Ana River Trail across Hamner Avenue Bridge shows that it will be a multi-purpose trail designed to accommodate pedestrians, cyclists, and equestrians. This photograph shows the current bridge with a single lane in each direction with inadequate space on the narrow existing sidewalk to accommodate trail users. This is another view of the current 80-year-old bridge from the river bottom. It has been determined to be structurally deficient in its current condition. In addition, the bridge is not safe during large storm events as shown here during the floods of 2010. 
This conceptual image of the new bridge depicts an improved design with greater clearance for stormwater. The image here shows that the new bridge will include the multi-purpose trail that would be funded through the proposed project and will include state-of-the-art structural, seismic, and hydraulic design for greatly improved safe crossing on the Santa Ana River Trail. This image depicts the design on the retaining wall on the bridge. The imagery pays homage to the city of Norco's reputation as Horsetown, USA. In this photo, you can see the lush riparian habitat that trail users will be able to view from the bridge trail. The new bridge will include areas for the variety of bat species that utilize the bridge as roosting habitat. Shown here is the timeline for the whole bridge construction project, including the access ramps and trail segment that comprises the proposed project. Environmental review is complete and final design and engineering is happening now. Construction is scheduled to begin in early 2021 and be completed by 2023. If you have any questions about the project, Uh, so, Joel, you're making this presentation. Are there any questions from to ask Joel from the board? This is Greg. I'm actually a bit here and available. It was just a technical difficulty in recording the presentation, and Joel jumped in and rescued us. Oh, okay, Greg. So we'll address our questions to you then. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, are there any public comments? Hillary, do we have any written comments on that? Yes, one was submitted that I can read. This was from Patricia Locke Dawson, Principal Consultant for the Santa Ana River Trail Parkway Local Advisory Group. So the comment is as follows. Chair Bosco and honorable members of the board, I am writing to request, request approval for agenda item 10. This project provides a critical connection in the completion of the 100 mile long Santa Ana River Trail and Parkway. The Coastal Conservancy and the Santa Ana River Conservancy Program have been crucial to keeping this extremely complicated project moving forward. The county and its partners are incredibly grateful for the support that the board has given us over the life of this project. The trail has been planned and built in fits and starts for over 40 years. Your support and approval for funding of this portion brings us one step closer to completion. Thank you for your interest and encouragement. I'm looking forward to taking you all on a tour when we're done. That's the end of the comment. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments? I guess not. Who would like to move approval of item 10? So Mark? moved. Okay, moved and, and Steve, do you want to second that? All right, moved and seconded that we approve item 10. All the, uh, please call the roll. Ms. Nadoff. Aye. Mr. Padilla. Aye. Mr. Cash. Aye. Ms. Gutierrez Grandich? Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Mr. Aliota? Aye. Chair Bosco? Aye. This motion passes. Agenda item 10 is approved. Okay, thank you, Greg. Uh, I guess we're going on to another project that Greg will present, and that is the city of Santa, Ro Santa Ana, the Santa Ana River Parkway Triangle Park. So, Greg? Take it away. Thank you, Chairman Bosco and members of the State Coastal Conservancy Board. This is Joel Gerwine and I will be presenting the City of Santa Ana Triangle Park Project on behalf of Greg Gothier. Staff recommends that the Conservancy Board authorize disbursement of up to $544,000 to the City of Santa Ana for final design and restoration of the Santa Ana River Parkway Triangle Park located along the Santa Ana River Trail in the city of Santa Ana in Orange. As shown on this aerial view of the Santa Ana River, outlined in orange, Triangle Park is immediately adjacent to the concrete line section of the Santa Ana River just east of 17th Street. The dark band crossing the river is a pedestrian and bicycle crossing connecting the Santa Ana River Trail that runs on both sides of the river here on the orange arrow in this wide angle aerial view of the region shows the location of the park and the lack of green space in this highly urbanized area. To the right of the park, you can see the Riverview Golf Course built in the bed of the river. And to the left, you can see the Willowick Golf Course. This concept plan for the park restoration 
shows the addition of new riparian landscaping and a new and improved viewing deck. The project also will include the installation of seating benches, river rock, boulders, fencing, trail, and interpretive signage, and improved ADA access. These two photographs show the Riverview Park and golf course on the left and the trail crossing that connects to Triangle Park. These two photographs show damage that was done to the park fencing and previous viewing deck due to encampments along the trail. The County of Orange has worked with encampment residents over the past year to secure alternative housing solutions, and the City of Santa Ana is providing additional assistance by directing homeless individuals and families to health organizations and housing assistance. These two photographs show another view of the observation deck on the left and erosion issues on the right. This final slide shows some of the opportunity areas for improving the riparian landscaping within the park. The landscaping will include large shade trees to provide a comfortable rest area for trail users. If you have any questions about the project, Greg is available to answer them now. Are there any questions from the board for Greg? I just wanted to comment that it's good to see these kind of projects in communities that ha don't have enough uh, open space. And these, I'd like to see more of these and it's, uh, this is a, looks like a really good one. Greg, I can't tell from the picture, but are these underserved communities or what, what is the demographics of, of the community that this project will benefit? Yes, this is located in, in a DAC. Which, which stands for a disadvantaged community. Thank you, Sam. Um, and uh, <clears throat> Annie, just, just FYI, so this is Sam. Um, uh, some years ago, I actually had a tour of this area and uh, got to look at that golf course, which is, is literally in the river. I mean, it's, it's like the concrete, it's a part of the river that's not channelized and the river goes like right through the golf course. Um, it's a and, trip. Yeah. And uh, needless to say, you know, if it ever comes up for sale, we will be all over it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking that looks like it would be great to do there what they, we've done at Palo Colorado. Yep. Yep, exactly. I would mention that while the Riverview Golf Course is not available, the Willowick golf course downstream is coming up for acquisition. And <coughs> already approached us on that project. How, how is a golf course in a navigable waterway? Isn't that public land? That's something that we do in Southern California. <laughs> you're, you're where I, I work out of my home in Palm Springs and we have many golf courses right in the riverbed. Wow. Right. Are there any other board member comments? Are there any public comments? And just as a reminder for the public, you can press star nine if you're on a phone or if you're on a computer, you can go to the bottom of the screen and there'll be a button that'll let you raise your hand. Okay, are there any written comments? No, none were submitted. Who would like to move approval of item 11? I would, I'll move Costco Gail Miller. Gail Miller is, has moved item 11. Who would like to second it? Second. Okay, Annie Nodoff, second. Those, please call the roll. Ms. Nodoff? Aye. Mr. Padilla? <laughs> Mr. Padilla? Aye. Mr. Cash? Aye. Ms. Gutierrez Grandinch? Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Mr. Alioto? Aye. Chair Bosco? Aye. This motion passes. Agenda item 11 is approved. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Let's go on then to item 12, which is the climate resiliency in the Barrio Logan community of San Diego, California. 
and it'll be presented by Ellen McDougall. Ella? Hello, Chairman Bosco and members of the State Coastal Conservancy Board. My name is Ella McDougall. I am the Climate Ready Fellow at the Conservancy this year, and I will be presenting the Barrio Logan Climate Resiliency Community Project. Staff recommends that the Conservancy authorize disbursement of up to $254,530 to the Environmental Health Coalition for a project that increases climate resiliency in the Barrio Logan community by developing a proposed Barrio Logan community plan update and preparing a preliminary plan for the Boston Avenue Linear Park in San Diego, California. The proposed source of funding for this project is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund appropriated to the Conservancy for its Climate Ready Program. This project is consistent with the purposes of those funds and was identified as a project that would support climate adaptation planning in a Cal Screen severely disadvantaged community. In this image, we see the location of Barrio Logan within the city of San Diego, the Highway 5 corridor, and the San Diego Bay. Barrio Logan, home to 55,000 residents, is the most underserved and climate vulnerable neighborhood in San Diego. It has less than half the green space and tree cover that is recommended by the National Recreation and Park Association and the highest levels of diesel related air pollution in San Diego County. This results in frequent heat waves and elevated rates of asthma, cancer, and other environmental and health. This project will address these local climate issues as well as confront a history of climate injustice. The Barrio Logan Climate Resiliency Community Project is made up of two complementary community planning components. The first component of this project is the creation of the proposed Barrio Logan Community Plan Update. This component is extremely important to the residents and advocates of Barrio Logan as they are still operating under their 1978 community plan. In 2013, a five-year effort to update the plan was defeated by referendum, causing tensions between the community and the city of San Diego. You can see a proposed neighborhood zoning map from the 2013 draft on this slide. Now, the city is moving forward to create a community plan update, collaborating with local community groups like the Environmental Health Coalition and industry leaders. EHC will work with planners to ensure the update includes considerations for sea level rise, climate adaptation, and green space conservation. Additionally, residents' feedback will be integrated into the creation of the proposed plan. This outreach effort will include a community leadership training program called Salud Ambiental Líderes Tomando Acción that aims to garner community sport, support and consensus. This photo shows outreach events underway in Barrio Logan and an artist's rendering of vibrant street life. The final product will be a proposed Barrio Logan community plan update for the city's consideration to adopt. The second component of the Barrio Logan Climate Resiliency Community Project is a preliminary plan for the Boston Avenue Linear Park. The space designated for this linear park is situated on the north side of Boston Avenue, as shown in this map. This area of Barrio Logan is one of the only strictly residential zones and therefore deserves a dedicated green space. There are three parcels shown in light green on this map, totaling approximately three acres that could be converted to park space. This park would increase the community's tree canopy and carbon sequestration capacity reducing air pollution and creating a cooling effect. The plans for the Boston Avenue Linear Park will be created through a community visioning process, utilizing the community action team and additional public workshops. The City of San Diego, EHC, and Assembly Member Todd Gloria's office are working together to secure the parcels shown in this image, which are listed by Caltrans as excess land. Once secured, EHC will hire a qualified contractor to develop preliminary park designs based on the vision created by the community. Both components of this project have broad community support 
and EHC has a long history working in Barrio Logan. These funds are important to support ongoing community engagement in the development of this twofold project. A community faced with socioeconomic injustices and major impacts from climate change deserves this project. Thank you, and we welcome your questions. EHC is on the line to say a few words. Okay, are there any members of the board that uh, have questions or comments? Um, I would just like to remark that um, um, Chicano Park, which is within this area, recently uh, celebrated a 50th anniversary, and I think this is an exciting, an exciting uh, conversation to be had this year. And Mr. Chairman, if I could just add, um, these two, uh, development of these two plans is critical to continuing to make progress around the community environmental health of a historically, uh, to say underserved is really not strong enough, but uh, uh, community and neighborhood uh, that is really uh, evolving and blossoming uh, despite some substantial um, adversity throughout its history. And the grantee here, Environmental Health Coalition, uh, I have worked with in the past, and they are an incredibly valuable and credible grantee, uh, for, particularly for this work in this community. It looks like there's a lot of um, upside to this. It's, it seems like it's just waiting to uh, capture people's imagination. It's nice to get in on the ground floor of that kind of planning. Doug, we, we have a hand up on the uh, attendee list. Uh, Dominique. Yes, thank you. My name is Dominique Navarro and I am the development director for the Environmental Health Coalition. I just wanted to thank you all for considering this proposal and I really wanted to thank the Coastal Conservancy staff, um, especially Ala McDougall and Emily Lopez. You, they have been incredible in understanding the challenges of the community, understanding the vision for this resident engagement process, um, and really representing the goals of the project to you all. So I really want to uh, give them a special shout out and say that we're happy to answer any questions that you have about the work moving forward. Well, thank you, Ms. Navarro. Are there any questions? And, and Doug, I just, Doug, I want to just note for the record that Ella McDougall is our news, is a new Sea Grant fellow. She's only been with us for a few months. So I hope you have some questions for her. Well, <laughs> you, know, Ella, you might have just escaped because of this new format, it isn't as easy to teach people. Uh, uh, but we I guess it's my lucky day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did a very good job on this. Thank you so much. It's been a really fun process to learn with EHC and Emily has been fantastic as a co-project manager. So thank you. I'm excited to see this project go forward. Where did you grow up, Bella? I grew up in Pennsylvania. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. And you did your C grant fellowship here? Yes, I studied in Monterey, and then I am now a Sea Grant Fellow with the Conservancy. Well, you did a very fine job. And um, I'm going to ask um, Mr. Padilla, would you like to move this? Yes, Mr. Chairman, happily. I'll move I'd approval. Like to second. I'd like to second. Okay, Marsh, you're seconding it. All the, would you please call the roll, Hillary? Ms. Nadoff. Aye. <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Padilla. Aye. Mr. Cash. Aye. Ms. Gutierrez Grundage. Aye. Ms. Miller. Aye. Mr. Aliotto. Aye. Chair Bosco. Aye. This motion passes. Agenda item 12 is approved. All right. Thank you, um, Ella. All right. We have only one item left, at least on the public part of our agenda. And that is item 13. Let me see here. And I see uh, Gail Miller has moved up in her boxes, has moved up with the rest of us now. <laughs> well, that's a, a big honor, you know. <laughs> Let me see if I can find item 13. Uh, 
Okay, that will be presented by Sam Jenicus, and it's the Tijuana River Valley Project. Sam? Good day, Chair Bosco and members of the Conservancy Board. My name is Sam Jenicus, and I'll be presenting the Tijuana River Sediment Management Plan and Monitoring Program to you today. Staff recommends that the Conservancy authorize disbursement of up to $500,000 to the City of Imperial Beach to prepare a sediment management work plan and monitoring program for the Tijuana River Valley in San Diego County. The plan will be used to inform the development, design, and implementation of future capital projects in the Tijuana River Valley. The Tijuana River watershed straddles the U.S.-Mexico border, terminating at the Tijuana estuary just after the main channel enters California. The river valley and estuary, seen here in lavender at the far west of the watershed, is a small portion of the river's 1,700 square mile watershed. This estuary is the largest intact and publicly protected coastal wetland in the Southern California Bight and is largely contained within the Tijuana River National Estuarine Research Reserve. Multiple tributary canyons and Just before crossing the border, the main stem and tributaries pass through Tijuana, one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in North America. Historically, the Tijuana River Valley has been significantly impacted by development in this metropolis. Inappropriate development practices and insufficient infrastructure introduce sources of sediment and pollution across the border into California. This sediment and the associated pollutants cross the border during precipitation events and sometimes during dry weather flows. Infrastructure on the U.S. side of the border has failed to successfully manage those flows when they reach the U.S., resulting in significant impacts to habitat and public health. After years of attempts to reduce these impacts through partnerships, the San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board is currently issuing TMDLs for indicator bacteria and trash in the Tijuana River. The sediment management plan for the River Valley has been a long-term goal of the local municipalities and state and regional agencies working in the river. A plan was proposed by the Tijuana River Valley Recovery Team in 2012 and formalized as a Tier 1 project in the team's five-year action plan in 2015. Finally, in 2017, Senate Bill 507 funded the Tijuana River Valley Needs and Opportunities Assessment. This was completed by the county in 2020 and identifies potential projects and management strategies that could be implemented on the U.S. side of the border. The needs assessment prioritizes a suite of projects to help manage flows of sediment and pollution on the U.S. side of the border, but at significant cost for implementation and annual maintenance. A monitoring program for sediment and water quality is among the projects recommended by the needs assessment. This plan will provide a comprehensive framework to inform the project development, stakeholder maintenance, and land management strategies identified in the needs assessment. It will provide the basis of the Valley stakeholder decision-making process for future sediment management in the River Valley and will identify existing and potential sources of sediment in the River Valley, as well as potential local reuse alternatives, both mapped here. Additionally, the monitoring program will establish a series of locations for water quality monitoring and sediment characterization. The plan will align with the current and anticipated regulatory processes, including the Water Quality Control Board's Land Disposal and TMDL program, and will provide data to the Water Quality Control Board and permittees of the TMDL program. These data will be necessary to demonstrate future successful compliance with the TMDL. This project will inform future capital projects that build on a history of conservancy and state investment in the Tijuana River Valley. The plan will help stakeholders to implement and manage capital projects that will protect and restore sediment transport processes 
in habitats in the valley. Outcomes of these sediment management projects will protect in the structure and function of critical natural resources and wetlands, improve water quality, and protect vulnerable infrastructure that is subject to coastal flooding, sea level rise, and other impacts from climate. Sam, can you fill in? Yeah. Um, let's see where was. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, outcomes of these sediment management projects will protect the structure and function of critical natural resources and wetlands, improve water quality, and protect vulnerable infrastructure that is subject to coastal flooding sea level rise and other impacts of climate change, while also protecting the public health of Californians that use these resources. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Sam. Are there any questions from the board? Yeah, Brian. Hey, Sam, I was just wondering how this um, funding will relate to the federal dollars that were just approved for the Tijuana River. Uh, that's to be seen a bit. I know um, that many of the local stakeholders um, hope to use the federal funding to address projects in the main stem of the river um, and state funding to address some of the implementation projects in the side canyons that enter into the river. Um, one of the things that um, this project will help with though is, is we've historically had a real problem with um, getting buy-in from stakeholders much around the topic of operations and maintenance costs with, costs with these projects. Uh, the Tijuana River Valley's O&M costs <clears throat> frequently are larger than the cost of implementation um, and, and are often very high. Um, and so we have a lot of stakeholders that <clears throat> are very careful about um, what they commit to and um, setting up this management sediment management um, work plan and, and monitoring program will help to inform um, some of the processes around cost saving and how o m can be conducted for these future implementation projects and that will include both federal projects and federally funded projects and state funded projects and i know one of the things that they're working on with the federal funding is actually to make that um, eligible for o m costs related to the projects. That's great. Yeah, I noticed, I, I watched a, a recent 60 Minutes special on the Tijuana River and it was eye-opening. The amount of o m costs that are needed is pretty amazing. Glad to hear that the federal government's gonna be able to help out there. Yeah, fingers crossed. Are there any other board comments, questions? Uh, just Mr. Chairman, just briefly again, just to piggyback on the dialogue just now with the staff, that the, the management program, the improvement of trash uh, containment basins, I mean, this, this, this disbursement is obviously helpful. It's small, it's very timely. Uh, if you understand the multitude of intersecting issues that are occurring, um, in the River Valley uh, and its pertinent environmental impact. So very happy to support the resolution. Do you want to move approval of it? I didn't know if we if we were, if we had any. Oh, I'll wait till we get to that. Yes, sir, I would make the motion at the appropriate time. All right. Anyone else on the board have any comments? If not, are there any public comments? Well, hearing none. Uh, I, I do. This oh. is, hi, this is Dominique Navarro, also again from the Environmental Health Coalition. And I just wanted to mention that uh, we work in binational communities. So we also work in Tijuana. And this is a critical, critical issue for our region. It affects both sides of the border. And I would highly encourage you all to vote for this project. Okay, thank you. Any other public comments? Hillary, did we get any written comments? No, we did not. All right. Then uh, Mr. Padilla moves, and who would like to second? Mars, you want to second? All right. Then we approve item 
13. Those in, please call the roll. Ms. Nodoff? Aye. Mr. Padilla? Aye. Mr. Cash? Aye. Ms. Gutierrez Groundinch? Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Mr. Aliotto? Aye. Chair Bosco? Aye. This motion passes. Agenda item 13 is approved. All right. Thank you very much, Sam. Good job. And now we're going on to, well, first of all, uh, we're finished with our project part of the agenda. And secondly, um, I understand that we have, we must have a um, executive session to hear uh, legal issues. But Sam, should we do the public comment in general first? Yeah, let's let's do conservancy member comments, which is item 14 and then public comments. All right. First before we go into executive session and then then just uh and just so everyone knows uh on the board Amy Hutzel has emailed you the separate phone line and the passcode for the executive session. So you should have that in your email and just so you know. But the next item is uh, Conservancy member comments. Right, this is a time when members of the Conservancy board may comment on anything they want. <laughs> so who would like to comment? <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Padilla. Uh, thank you, sir. With your indulgence, I would, um, like to share a statement I made uh, as chairman of the Coastal Commission at the June hearing that focused on sort of the mo moment and movement in our country regarding social justice. And I suspect that uh, many of what I will share uh, are shared by this agency and, and our board. And so with your indulgence, I've been asked to share this statement, uh, which I would like to do so now, if that's okay. Sure. Go ahead. All right. Um, as a public agency with an important public trust, we wish to respect, honor, and recognize this moment in our nation's history, a movement which is righteous, painful, necessary, and long overdue, which demands that our society confront the reality of systemic racism and injustice which persists in our culture. Whether we participate in or just witness this movement of thousands across our nation in many communities taking to the streets to call for action, we are reminded that this opportunity will require more than protests. This moment demands open minds and open hearts in order to make understanding possible. It will require understanding in order to make accountability and action possible and requires accountability and action in order to make reconciliation and change a reality. The commission and I believe the conservancy strive to protect natural and coastal resources and access for all people to these resources. Getting this work right requires we do so while understanding the tremendous economic, social and equitable impacts of what often appears only on the surface to involve planning and land use. To this end, our commitment to environmental justice, this work in our work is of course groundbreaking, but there remains much to do. Our values require us to practice transparency, fairness, and equity in our work, and today we, re we reassert our commitment to these values. In this moment, we acknowledge and lift up the memory of George Floyd and all victims of unnecessary violence under color of authority and extend our condolences to their families and friends. We assert the conviction that Black Lives Matter in order to recognize and respect the unique experiences of African Americans and Black Americans of every background in America, and also to stand in solidarity against historic and systemic exclusion and oppression against peoples of color everywhere. As a commission and an agency, we encounter activism and engagement from diverse populations in support of critical issues, including environmental and coastal protection, and of course, environmental justice on a daily basis. But it's important to draw a clear distinction between those important issues and this movement. This moment and the movement it has inspired is about making the choice to confront the uncomfortable truths about a continuing legacy of systemic racism, implicit bias, 
and racial and cultural division within our social, economic, and political systems. We are committed to being part of this conversation, to not only giving voice, but to taking responsibility to act in our service to the public. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to share that. Well, thank you, Steve. Ms. Miller? I, I, you know, I, I wasn't gonna say anything, but Mr. Padilla, I think that was really um, lovely. And I know I personally have made a commitment to intentionally listen. And I do feel like the Coastal Commission and a huge shout out to Sam and his team <coughs> who had the forethought during our talk about the Jedi principles of why these issues and structural racism specifically are so important. So thank you. And I don't know, Mr. Padilla, and I hope this is appropriate, but I'm just personally happy to see you looking so well. And I followed your journey and your interviews, and you've been an inspiration in many ways. So I'm glad to see you back and hope you're doing well. Are there any other comments? Um, I'd like to make one. First of all, thank you for a very eloquent statement. And I want to uh, talk about, uh, for a second, about the Jedi principles. Um, I actually have put off our consideration of them because I was hoping that we could do it in person because it's an important thing for our board to consider. And I think it would have uh, been very nice for us to be able to face each other, see each other, and talk about these important principles. Uh, but that doesn't look like we're going to be able to do uh, in the near future. So I think on our next meeting's agenda, we will uh, consider the Jedi principles. And it's, it's, as you point out, a very apropos period of time to do that. Um, um, we have a lot of work to do, for sure. And, and, and for those of you that don't know, uh, Jedi is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, it's not actually a reference to uh, Star Wars. <laughs> Um, uh, Chair Bosco, if, if yes. I could briefly, I, I just want to echo Mr. Padilla's comments uh, that obviously this has been a call to action, um, not just those of people of color, uh, but really for every single person in our society, regardless of what their level of privilege is. And I can't say how important it is for all of those who have grown up in privileged backgrounds to take up arms in any way possible uh, against uh, the systemic method uh, methodological racism that's kind of existed in our culture for so many years. Um, my personal thoughts on this, and I know this is well beyond the scope of what we are discussing here today, uh, is uh, criminal justice reform specifically. And there's so much that can be done in that particular area. So I just wanna echo uh, your comments, uh, Mr. Padilla. I think it is a call to action on behalf of all of us and everybody needs to heed that call. And back to the scope of what we're discussing here today, I just wanna say uh, how impressed I am with everything that I have seen here today, uh, specifically the work that has been done by the staff on each of these tremendous projects, the amount of, uh, of, of work that obviously went in and the analysis and the thoughtful analysis, I uh, just wanna say how proud I am to be a part of what you are doing. And thank you again uh, for welcoming me so uh, openly. Well, you're certainly welcome. And I want to expand a little bit on that too, um, Joe, because in addition to the great work our staff does on the items that we consider, they do a lot of work in just us being able to meet the way we've been meeting. And a lot of people have worked hard on this. It's a good job. We're able to get our business done and, um, and do what we're supposed to do for the people of the state. So I want to thank, um, everyone. I don't even want to mention names, although I will mention Amy's name as one who I, I know has worked very, very hard on this with a great team and Hillary, you too, and, and many others. Um, all right. Are there any public 
me are members of the public that would like to address the board? Okay, I guess not. So no, uh, Doug. Actually, we have uh, a hand up, uh, Anna Christensen, and I think you've been unmuted. All right, Anna Christensen, are you there? Uh, Anna, you just muted yourself. Go ahead and unmute yourself. A new phrase we have, unmute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Speak up. Okay, now, now, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we got oh, you. Good. All right, here we go. Um, Thank you. First of all, good morning, board members. Thank you for your work and for this opportunity to address you in support of the Los Cerritos wetlands within the sacred site of Pavugna in Long Beach. Mr. Padilla speaks to this moment in history and calls on us all to consider past wrongs and to right them. Because the Coastal Conservancy is a member of the Los Cerritos Wetlands Authority, we are bringing a matter of immediate concern to your attention. There has been censorship of public input during virtual public meetings on May 21st and June 4th regarding the project EIR for the LCWA's Los Cerritos Wetlands Restoration Project. Some participants have been prevented from asking multiple questions of the presenters, although time was allocated for them to do so, and all other questions had been answered. Additionally, attempts to enter questions and comments into the public chat line were blocked. Therefore, these questions and concerns were not heard by or visible to others participating in the workshop, nor are they part of the recorded meeting. Because those hosting public meetings engaged in illegally restricting public participation, they've ensured the public record is incomplete. While we focus on public health, there are negative consequences for the wetlands, the general, general public, excuse me, and the LCWA in limiting public participation. Fewer than 100 people have attended the virtual public meetings, and this number includes LCWA staff and project consultants. While we appreciate that the LCWA has extended the public comment period for an additional two weeks, we do not believe this addresses the magnitude of the problem. Because the LCWA is the lead agency, the PEIR will not come before either Seal Beach or Long Beach Planning Commissions or City Councils, which are followed by significant numbers of residents nor does the LCWA publicize its quarterly meetings beyond posting them on the agency's website and contacting those on its mailing list. With respect to the Los Cerritos Restoration Project, PEIR, the LCWA has failed to ensure that more than the bare minimum of public input required by law is received. Now, due to censorship by those running the meet virtual public meetings, even this is subject to debate. We ask that the LCWA and its member agencies, including the Coastal Conservancy, take immediate action to better inform the public of the PEIR and to solicit additional public comments. We ask that the LCWA hold additional public meetings on the PEIR at venues where appropriate social distancing can be practiced and that those uh, preferring to attend and participate online be able to do so. When a vote is taken, we ask that the LCWA meeting be held at a venue where appropriate social distancing can be practiced and that those pretending to, preferring to attend also be allowed to do so. And um, what I would say in brief, because I think I've used up my minutes, is that this particular project uh, is, is, is so invasive. It is nothing but berms and digging. There's no restoration here. This is a destruction of the existing wildlife habitat. And, and unlike the oil drilling project, uh, which had visits to the site and numerous public meetings and went out and did tremendous outreach. Of course, it was all the oil company doing the outreach and it was a mythology about what was going to happen. Still, this it seems to be the opposite strategy of, of keeping everything on the down low. So I would really hope that we could have more public input. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Are there any other public comments? All right, now one. we're- Chair, there was one submitted um, by email. I can read. All right. This is from Angela Kemsley of Wild Coast. Wild Coast, a nonprofit organization which conserves coastal and marine ecosystems and addresses climate change through natural solutions, 
would like to thank the Coastal Conservancy for your continued support to protect California's network of marine protected areas, also known as MPAs, which comprise 545, 280, 280 acres of some of the most ecologically, culturally, and economically important resources in our state. We would also like to thank the Conservancy for its continued work to support innovative programs that build conservation stewardship capacity among the new generation. Wild Coast Explore My MPA project, which the Conservancy supports, engages students from underserved communities and tribes in San Diego County in MPA-based education, conservation, and recreation activities. The project uses Wild Coast MPA Outreach Toolkit to reach about 200 high school and middle school students and their educators every year in experiential outdoor learning, community science, and marine-based recreation activities in local MPAs. Thanks to our generous supporters, including the Coastal Conservancy, Wild Coast has engaged over 2,000 students in innovative field-based programs and reached over 10,000 students in the classroom at, at events. For many students, it's their first time seeing the ocean and their first time participating in real scientific research. Thanks to the immersive hands-on nature of this project, more than 90% of participants report feeling more connected to their coastal and marine spaces and more likely to take conservation action after participating in our project. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Wild Coast has moved many of our, our activities online, including a virtual version of our floating laboratory and a series of MPA-related activities and lessons that students can do at home. Wild Coast is always happy to share resources and we would love for you to join one of our virtual experiences that are supported by the Conservancy. We are currently developing guidelines to get students back out into the field and we would love for you to join that opportunity when it becomes available. Thank you again for your continued support and ongoing work to conserve California's marine protected areas. Okay. Are there any other public comments written or otherwise? All right, if not, uh, Sam, do we need to have a closed session? Yes, uh, we do need to have a closed uh, session and uh, you should have received via email uh, me uh, three memos uh, from uh, our legal staff uh, for Conservancy members and staff who are joining the closed session, uh, what we'll need you to do is mute your phone and stop your video, but don't log out of the Zoom call. Uh, and then uh, Amy Hutzel has emailed you the call-in number and the passcode for the executive session. Uh, for staff and for the public, we're going to keep the Zoom running. And uh, when we're done with executive session, we'll come back into public session uh, on Zoom uh, and, then, uh, and then adjourn uh, the meeting. So uh, does uh, board members, do you all have, maybe just nod your head, do you all have the, uh, the phone line for the, okay. And Chair Bosco, just for the record, we're going to be talking about items 16A, B, and C on the closed session agenda. All right. Okay, so we mute our, our phone, stop the video, leave it all on, and call you at this and, number. And call in on a separate phone line. That's right. Mr. Chair, might we, might we have a few minutes to do that, maybe a, a quick break? <laughs> I was going to suggest that, too. Why don't we give ourselves 10 minutes uh, to do that? And okay. And let's see, it's five after 12 now. Let's say we'll meet again at 12.15 on the phone. All right? Okay, everyone, see you later. It's Gail, but the, I think someone stopped my video probably because I forgot to. Un yes. You were, you were bad. You forgot to turn your video off, so we had to do it for you. But maybe I'm sorry, I have Zoom fatigue. <laughs> so I, over Zoom. I, am, I was I'm, just gonna remark that I'm pretty impressed with our uh, flexibility between the different modes. I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, it's impressive, but Joe, the thing you didn't ask about is um, that like the most, the best part about the Coastal Conservancy is we get to like see things. So that's what you're missing today. You know, I was going to say, I wanted to mention that. I, uh, I have now a list of about 15 places that I'm just going to take my truck and go drive around and check it out. <laughs>
Yeah. Totally, I know. Start, start with those little rivers up on the north coast, for sure. Yeah. The field yeah. trips are the best. Yeah. You know, the, the really, if, you were, um, if you're down in Southern California, some of that stuff in Oxnard, yeah. like don't think of it all, is some of the most interesting areas of sort of access and how to get more people access and like all the issues around equity I felt like are like encapsulated in yeah. Oxnard if you're down there ever it's like I'm yeah. sure you know well, about do, it. do we have a meeting scheduled for the for Southern California this year or just North Coast I think um <laughs> yeah so, maybe it's be Zoom do we ever have another meeting scheduled <laughs> We we, uh, we have meetings scheduled, but I'm not optimistic that we're going to be meeting in person during this calendar year. While um, we're on this call, the governor did put out face coverings guidance. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, however, I mean, obviously, if, if we can resume, you know, meeting, we will do that. All yeah. right, I'll put mine on. Okay, that's good. <laughs> and 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 Mine's Joe, good, I. Doug. Oh. Oh, Gail has a real fashion forward. Uh, <laughs> Gail, I'm amazed that you can even be at our meeting considering oh. everything that's going on in your department. I know. Joe, I just wanted to mention that. If oh, you, I like it, Annie. You look good. That's good. That. That's a good one. That is a if, good one. If you wanted to sort of take your own field trip somewhere, just give us a call and we can actually set you up with where to go and and what you what you would see great i will do that for sure practically nowhere in the coastal counties of the state that you can't see oh really is there I'm something huh i'm just saying that I, almost anywhere yeah, no I, i'm going down to orange county this with the kids so so uh uh you know give uh, shoot me an email and we'll come okay. up with a little itinerary for you thanks so, okay you. well um Unfortunately, due to this new format, I don't have a gavel to use. But I will call the meeting back in back to order and report that the board um, considered uh, three items that are on the agenda on our list for a closed session. And um, having said that, um, our next meeting will be on the North Coast, or probably more likely um, in the same format that we have today, but the meeting will be in September. And if there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. everybody. Have a great summer. Have a great, have a great summer. summer. Stay have safe. Summer. Stay safe. Yeah, stay safe, everyone. <laughs> Steve, it's good to have you back amongst the living. Thank you, sir. It's great to be back. Looking forward to the path forward.